Good morning. We want to share three stories with you today about how the patent system is working for patients, both here and abroad. Our stories are about access to affordable medicines, the innovation of new therapies, and the new enforcement climate around the patent system. So our first story uh, starts in 1996 in India. And at this time, companies were selling a drug for chronic myeloid leukemia called imatinib mesylate. Known here in the United States as Gleevec, this drug cost $250 per patient per month, a price that was already unaffordable for most Indians. 900 million people in India live on less than $2 a day. And, <coughs> excuse me live on less than $2 a day, and there's no comprehensive health insurance system or social safety net. Now, thanks to the work of health organizations in India, the cost of this medicine and others like it are subsidized, and people do have access to the drug. At least they did until 2005. Now, in 2005, the Swiss company Novartis uh, got an exclusive right on the drug akin to a patent. And in the blink of an eye, the price of the drug went up from $250 to $2,500. Just to put this in context, that's $30,000 a year per patient out of pocket. It was an unconscionable price hike. Now, the patients in this story didn't take this lying down. They joined forces with people from all walks of life who realized that access was on the line, and they fought back. What was remarkable for us to witness, we worked there at the time, was that they didn't just protest on the street. They started to use institutions of justice in a path-breaking way. They took their fight to the Indian Patent Office, where they filed a legal case called a patent opposition. And in doing so, we believe that they started to register their resistance to a new multilateral trade regime that was impacting their rights as low-income citizens. In filing this particular case, they set off a wave of motion across the globe, across developing countries, against unfettered private rights. Now, in this case, in 2006, the cancer patients did end up winning. The patent on imatinib mesylate was actually rejected. Generic competition flourished, prices came down, and patients were able to stay on the drug or get access to it for the first time. At that time, this literally meant the difference between life and death. Now, what's happened in India has a, happened across the globe, uh, from Thailand to China, from <coughs> Colombia to the Philippines, in Europe, the United States. Um, people are getting involved in the patent system. And despite how technocratic it is, the patent system is actually also very uh, democratic and open. Any person has the right to get involved, and a growing number of people are doing so. We believe that this is because the patent system is actually failing in one of its two most important functions. See, it was founded for two principles. The first was to reward inventors for their creativity. But the second, just as important objective, was to disclose and disseminate those inventions to society. Now, we live in a world where two billion people lack access to medicines, and of course we recognize that's because of a multitude of reasons. But our work on the ground in developing countries shows that the patent system time and time again does serve as an obstacle to access and does require meaningful reform. What we want you to take away from this story is how powerfully effective public participation can be within the patent system. Here in the United States, we need to work to expand our own mechanism for public participation to help drive drug prices down and expand access to medicines. <coughs> so our second story is about innovation. It's about how we reward inventions and give companies uh, exclusive rights to prolong the life cycle of products endlessly. The story I'm going to talk about is actually regarding two drugs, key HIV therapies, that's lapinavir and ritonavir, also known as Norvir and Coletra. Just to give you some background sort of facts and uh, to give you some understanding what's happened around this drug. 
In 2003, US physicians actually led a movement against Abbott Laboratories for its 400% price hike on the drug Norvir. In El Salvador and Peru, Abbott was charging the drug for $4,500. That's 720% higher than the benchmark price. This is happening in a number of other countries around the world, and it continues to do so today. So much so that former President Bill Clinton actually spoke out against Abbott's actions and said that they were standing alone in blocking affordable access to generics. So the question is, how is Abbott able to do this? Well, simply put, it's actually using the patent system. You see, the patents, the original patents on these drugs were actually are due to expire in 2012 and 2014. That should mean other companies should be able to come into the marketplace, do other R&D, perhaps even combine Norvir with another protease inhibitor, such as atazanavir. It would mean competition. It would mean prices should come down. But is this actually going to happen anytime soon? Well, unfortunately not. Because what Abbott has done is actually filed successive patents year after year after year in order to maintain its exclusivity till at least 2024. Now, what we found is that they filed 35 patents since 1992, which works out roughly about two patents every year. And based on our research, what we found is none of these patents actually show anything new over what's already been invented. Call it in legal speak, we call that double patenting. Now, the industry likes to present this type of patenting in a different way. They use the word incremental innovation. But we find that a little bit misleading because where you're not actually improving something but actually gaming the system, there's a big difference. They also like to call it life cycle management. Now, life cycle management is this wonderful innovative strategy that the business has come up with to actually prolong the life cycle of products and maintain endless exclusive control over them. So we have to ask, has this actual life cycle management strategy and the proliferation of patents resulted in more innovation? Well, since the 1990s, we've actually seen a decline in the number of new marketed compounds. The days when we actually had flashes of genius for, and were rewarding inventions for flashes of genius, those days have gone. These days, we're actually giving patents for crustless peanut jelly sandwiches, a method of how to exercise a cat, or simply, you know, if you taste the, taste the, uh, change the taste of a syrup, you know, you get 20 years of patents for it. So there is another way of actually looking at this and moving forward in a different way. What we could do is actually say, you know what, we're only going to give you the full 20-year patent term for something that's new, something that doesn't exist. So if you actually develop a new drug, a new compound, then you get your full 20 years. But if you're actually just tinkering with something that already exists on the market, you might only get a few more years. See, what we have to do is we have to get these companies to start thinking and saying, are you going to just keep picking low-hanging fruit? Are you in the, just in the business of saving lives or saving the life cycle of products? What we need to do is actually predicate the patent terms on the quality of the inventions. And our third story is the change of scene. A ship set sail last year from India for Brazil, and on board the ship there were life-saving medicines. Now I want to point out these drugs were not on patent in India or Brazil. So this was a lawful sale and purchase between two developing countries. But on the way from India to Brazil, something really interesting happened. The ship stopped at a port in the Netherlands, and Dutch uh, customs officials seized the drugs and prevented them from going on their way to Brazil, where patients were waiting for them. The Dutch customs official said that because these drugs were on patent in the Netherlands, this constituted patent infringement that the ship had passed through their port. I want to emphasize again that this was a lawful transaction <laughs> between two developing countries. And this isn't the only ship whose goods have been seized. This action by these customs officials marks a new era in patent enforcement across the world. We're starting to see the generics industry be shut down, and governments are starting to curtail who can sell drugs and at what cost. We wanted to share this story with you today because it marks a critical crossroads in history. It really showcases the battle that's going on 
between multinational pharmaceutical companies and developing country governments, as well as patients on the ground. This is a battle to shape the boundaries of how trade is going to be conducted going forward in the new millennium. And the role that Western governments are playing today, intervening on behalf of pharmaceutical companies like the Dutch customs officials did, this is going to shape the access landscape of tomorrow. Now in this case, India and Brazil have joined forces to take the European Union to the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement panel. And other countries are joining them, like China and Ecuador. We believe it would make more sense to find common ground with these countries rather than engaging in trade retaliation and pressure tactics. The more that we do that, the more that these countries are organizing and building networks to engage in resistance and advocate against us. It would make more sense to build bridges and to support these countries in their efforts and their endeavors to ensure health for all their citizens. So that's just three stories we've shared with you today. There are many more. But we have three key ideas based on these stories of how we actually can change the current system and actually improve access for all. The first thing, as Breeti has already mentioned, is to increase public participation in the patent system. We need a more democratic patent system. As the patients in India have shown, by getting involved in the patent system, they were able to have their voices heard and they actually managed to keep the drugs that they needed available. This is happening in other countries now, elsewhere. So at all costs, we need to preserve this kind of public participation. We also need to advocate such, for such a system here in the US because it doesn't currently exist. And by doing so, what we do is we strengthen the system and we actually bring much needed transparency. A second thing, uh, thing we offer is the fact that we need to actually encourage real innovation. Let's predicate patent terms on the quality of the invention. Like I said, you need to give 20 years for something that's really innovative. If you're just tinkering, you may only get a few years. Now, we see we need to go back to the founding principles of the patent system. We seem to have lost our way a little bit. We need to go back to what it's really about, about rewarding real inventions. And lastly, these excessive enforcement measures need to be scaled back. We need to build bridges with developing countries. And we need to actually allow lawful and legitimate trade in generic medicines so that those two billion people can have a chance at access to medicines and life. Thank you. Thanks. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you.